Hello. Hi, everyone. I hope you're well. Uh, this is Dr. Victoria Nerule. And in today's session, we want to talk about the types of energy agreements. Obviously, there are different types of energy. You have renewable energy, you have fossil fuels, including oil, gas, and coal. So there are different agreements or contracts that a government would get into to sign with the international energy companies. And obviously, we have to know the basis for these agreements. In most countries, the oil resources belong to the government because of the international principle of sovereignty over natural resources, implying that each and every country owns their resources. In some countries, like the U.S., uh, individuals can own natural can own natural resources. In other countries, like uh, South Africa, Uganda, Ghana, Nigeria. Uh, the UK, the resources belong to the government, which holds them as a custodian for their people. So having understood that the resources belong to the government or to their communities, then we have to analyze how an international oil company or even an, a national energy company can get into the business of exploiting and develop, developing these resources. And for this to happen, they would need to sign a contract or an agreement. So in the oil and gas sector, you would have different types of contracts that would enable the international oil and gas company to have access and the rights to develop the uh, the resources, uh, the, the resources in the contract and the specified contracts. So today's session, we want to talk about the different types of uh, petroleum agreements and why would the government go for one particular type of petroleum agreement instead of choosing the other? We have concessions, we have risk service agreements, we have pet uh, uh, petroleum pr production sharing agreements. So all those are the different types of contracts or agreements in the oil and gas sector. And today's session is just about us understanding uh, the different types of petroleum agreements and why a government would choose one type over the other. So we're going to focus because the energy sector, obviously, is a wide sector. You would have renewables, uh, solar energy, and everything. So today's session, we're going to focus on the petroleum agreements. So there are several petroleum agreements that a government has to choose from. These include consensions, a license, or which is also sometimes called the license agreement. You have a petroleum sharing agreement. You have a joint venture or a service agreement. And these agreements are very important because they govern the relationship between the government and oil and gas investors. The agreement would have to stipulate the fiscal regime. It would have to stipulate the rights of the investor. It would have to include uh, uh, provisions relating to environmental protection, and nowadays we are seeing uh, provisions like local content provisions being included in petroleum agreements. So it's that agreement that really governs the relationship between the investor and the host state. How are they going to work together in developing the resources? What percentage is the investor taking? Or what kind of revenue or taxes are they going to pay? all that has to be included in the petroleum agreement. So it's very important because it governs the relationship between the host state and the oil and gas companies. So we're going to start with a, a concession, which is also sometimes called a license agreement. So concession or license agreements grant an oil company a right to explore, develop, sell, and export the oil extracted in a specified area for which the company has received exclusive development and production rights for a prescribed period of time. All this is done against payment of a royalty to the host state. So with the consensus or a license, you note the aspect of exclusive rights. So the oil and gas investor or oil and gas company has the exclusive right to develop the oil and gas resources the specified oil and gas resources, but it's also within a prescribed period of time, implying that there is a start and there's an end to that contract. And most importantly, with the license or concession, the oil company has to pay a royalty to the state. So the issue of royalty is very key because if you negotiate with an oil company and they are giving you 
uh, little royalty or little taxes, that means that the, the country will be will not be benefiting. So the negotiation, when it comes to the payment of royalties, the percentage that the oil company has to pay is very important in the concession because it will determine how much the government and the, uh, and the host communities I, or even the citizens of that country are going to benefit from an oil agreement. If the royalty is not well negotiated, that's why you'll find instances where the host government is complaining that they are not benefiting from their oil and gas. So negotiation is very key, especially in the concession, because if you do not negotiate very well when it comes to royalties to be paid to the host state, then the oil and gas will not be beneficial for the communities and the government itself. And then a petroleum sharing agreement or petroleum sharing contracts, sometimes they're called PSAs. Uh, these were first introduced in Indonesia in, the 19, in 1966. So you see that uh, PSAs have been there, they have been in existence for quite some time. And under this type of agreement, the host government, as the owner of the resources, engages an international oil company, or here for them the IOC, as a contractor to provide technical and financial services for exploration and development operations. And as a reward for the risks taken, the international oil and gas company acquires an entitlement to the stipulated share of the oil produced. So here, there is an aspect of sharing on the oil that is being produced, that is the reward that the oil company gets. And in this type of agreement, the host government and the oil and gas companies, they are working together to develop the resources and then they share on the oil that is being produced. But then with the consensus, remember, the, the, host, uh, the host government gives the oil company an exclusive right to develop the resources and the oil company only pays a royalty to the host government. But with the petroleum sharing agreement, they are sharing they're developing the resources and then as a reward for the risks that the oil and gas company is taking in developing these resources they are given on a share they, they, they are given on a share of the oil that is being produced so that is the main difference between the concession and the petroleum sharing agreement and then also here with the consent with the uh, petroleum sharing agreement you notice that the host state will be able to um, to train their own employees because they are getting involved in this in the development they are seeing exactly how the international oil companies are operating there is the issue of technological transfer all that comes with the benefits of having a petroleum sharing agreement and most developing countries are using the petroleum sharing agreement because they need to also train their own people and for the national oil companies in those uh, developing countries for them to also get the expertise and training and even the technical know-how on how to develop their resources so that's why it's very key for uh, developing countries so we have talked about the concessions which is also a license agreement we have also talked about the petroleum sharing agreement now there is another type of agreement and that is the risk service agreement and under the risk service agreements, the host state merely hires the service of a petroleum company or a consortium to benefit from its financial and technical expertise with the company or consortium assuming the risk and liability after which it is reimbursed through a service fee, usually paid in cash. So here, the government would pay a service fee. A, a service fee and the government would hire would only hire the oil and gas company to develop the resources and then they are paid a fee how is it different from a petroleum sharing agreement with the petroleum sharing agreement both the government and the oil company they are developing the resources together and then as a reward the oil company is given on the share of the oil that is being pr uh, produced but here as a reward the company is paid a service fee and how is it different from a concession with a concession is the company that pays a royalty because they are the ones who have the exclusive right to develop so they they pay the host state a royalty but then with the risk service agreement 
the, is the host state now that would pay the company a service fee, sometimes cash for their for the work that they have undertaken. And in this agreement, the oil company doesn't have the exclusive right to develop. The resources still belong to the government, but they're only being hired to deliver to to deliver service or to do a service. So that is the main difference between the risk service agreements, uh, concessions, and then petroleum sharing agreements. Now, the other we, we have to move forward to the joint venture contracts. Uh, joint ventures are also very common, especially in the oil and gas sector, because obviously with the oil and gas sector or even the extractive sector generally, these are capital intensive ventures. And in most cases, the capital is mass massive and the one, can one company, sometimes companies can develop their resources themselves. Other times they would get into joint ventures with other companies to form a consortium that will be able to de develop their resources. So where there is that joint venture or where there is a consortium, then those companies would need to sign a joint operating agreement. And this is where the aspect of the joint venture contracts come into play. So a joint venture arises if two or more parties wish to pursue a joint undertaking. It is a partnership-based agreement between the two parties with a view to jointly, with a view to jointly running an extractive venture. The agreement provides a structured means for shared decision meaning, uh, for shared decision making. And now we're going to move forward to some of the provisions that are found in petroleum agreements. So there are different provisions that you'll find in a petroleum agreement. Uh, first, you have the production lifetime, then you have the period, the time frame for developing the resources. You have the uh, provisions relating to the fiscal regime, taxation, environmental provisions, uh, of recent, we are seeing local content provisions and all those, there are different provisions to be included in a petroleum agreement. And after this class, I would advise you to get one petroleum agreement, be it a concession, be it a, 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 petroleum, a production sharing agreement, and just look through the various provisions that are found in those agreements. So we realize there are so many provisions of their various provisions found in um petroleum agreement. In this class, we're going to focus on some of the provisions that have uh, seemed to be problematic in the 21st century. And one of those provisions is the uh, stabilization clauses and petroleum agreements. So stabilization clauses are not found in all the contracts that countries sign. You'd find that the countries in the global north, most of them do not provide stabilization clauses, while the countries in the global south, most of them would be providing uh, uh, stabilization clauses. So what are they? Stabilization clauses have increasingly become an important subject given their impact on the sovereignty of a state over its natural resources. The resource cast notwithstanding the discovery of petroleum resources generally engineers national dreams of riches and economic prosperity. Indeed, there are countries that have benefited significantly from these resources, including Norway, the United Kingdom, the United States, the United Arab Emirates, and so on. But what the, uh, the stabilization clause now would do is to ensure that when a country has entered into a petroleum agreement with a host, with an investor, they stabilize that some of the terms of that agreement, like the fiscal stabilization clauses, whereby there will be a provision that the country should not, the host state should not increase the taxes or change the terms of the agreement when it comes to taxation within that spe specified period. So in, in, in a sense, they are stabilizing, they're stabilizing the situation, they're stabilizing the terms of the contract. So that's what stabilization clauses do, so that you don't make any unnecessary changes that are likely to have a negative impact on the, uh, on the benefits or the economic aspects of that project in the country. So they have stabilization clauses of a physical nature and stabilization clauses of a legal or regulatory nature. So you can stabilize the terms that would have an impact on the physical regime, including taxation, 
or the stabilization clauses can have an impact on the legal or regulatory nature. So the main types of stabilization clauses will have the fiscal stabilization clauses and the legal stabilization clauses. However, there are various other types under underneath those, but all of them, they have to fall under the, either the legal aspect or the fiscal aspect. So let's start with the fiscal stabilization clauses. They relate to the government revenue, including taxes, royalties, and customs duties. And while the legal stabilization clauses, on the other hand, covers laws and regulations of a non-fiscal character, such as the statutes that govern operations at the project site on a day-to-day -day basis, mining laws, labor laws, environmental laws, to mention but a few. Then you have the freezing clauses. And with the freezing clauses in the legal profession, these are also referred to as stabilization clause stricto sensu. <laughs> sensu. So freezing clauses are to the effect that the governing laws general and special applicable to operations under a contract between a company and a sovereign state should be those of the state at the time the contract was executed. So with the freezing clauses, it means that you are freezing the terms of the contracts. If you send an agreement in 2024 and that agreement has to stay in place until 2026. That with the freezing clause, it's to the impact that the terms you agreed upon in 2024 should be the same until the end of the contract, which is 2026. So it's freezing. You cannot change anything. If it's the taxation and you agreed on, let's say 20% royalties, you cannot reach in 2025 and change it to 30% uh, royalty. You have to remain on the same terms. What is the problem with the freezing clauses? First, you have to look at the time frame for contracts. Oil and gas agreements are for a very, they are long term ventures, implying that the contract can be for 30 years, it can be for 20 years, it can be for 35 years. So if you freeze the terms of the agreement for 35 years, that is detrimental, especially for the host government, because you are freezing your ability to even change the fiscal regime for that petroleum agreement. That implies that you cannot increase the royalties, you cannot increase the taxes, you cannot benefit in any way when the, the economics of a country are changing. So the freezing clauses are very dangerous clauses, especially in the 21st century, because there is a lot that is changing economically, socially, politically. A lot of things are changing. And now environmentally, countries now are enacting environmental laws. They're enacting climate change laws. So as a government, you have to look back at the contracts that you signed and ensure that if they are aligned with your social economic and economic prosperity of a country and also the environment or even the climate change um climate change updates that we are seeing so societies are always evolving progressing from one state to another implying that if you have a freezing clause that wants you to remain in the same terms for 30 years without changing or progressing that is not good especially for the host state so when applied strictly, the freezing clauses prohibit the host state from changing its laws by effectively freezing the laws which were in force on the date that the contract came into effect, hence shielding the international oil company from any changes in legislation occurring after this date. Freezing clauses may be used in different ways. So that is the freezing clause. It would freeze that state of the contract for that specified period of time, be it 30 years, you cannot change the terms. Then we have the economic equilibrium or economic stabilization clauses. And these seek to reestablish the economic position. And the economic equilibrium of the contract following changes in law, which have an economic impact on the bargain struck between the host state and its contractual partner. They provide protection through a renegotiation mechanism. So with economic equilibrium, 
there is a provision for you to renegotiate. And whereas the investors are supposed to comply with the new laws, they are entitled to compensation so that they remain in the same economic situation they would have been in had the laws not changed. This function as an indemnity clause, which provides balance to the economic equilibrium of the contract by ensuring that the appropriate remedies are available to the investor if the host state's actions adversely affect the underlying economics of the relevant project. The common form of remedy is compensation. So with the economic equilibrium, equilibrium it's not a freezing clause, but where the investor feels like the new changes or new legislations are going to negatively impact the economic situation or status of their project, they are afraid to renegotiate with the host state or they are entitled to compensation. So there is also protection for the international oil company and they are being protected from any adjustments on laws or the fiscal regime that is going to negatively impact on their uh on on their economic aspects of the project so economic equilibrium it's more about protecting the investors profits the investors uh, money to ensure that it's not reduced or they not do they do not make losses because of the laws that have been introduced and where the laws have been reintroduced the host state and the international oil company can negotiate if not if not negotiating then they can pay the company monetary compensation. Then we have the rebalancing of benefits, and these clauses are similar to economic equilibrium. They basically envisage automatic adjustments or renegotiation of contract terms in the event that specified circumstances occur. They stipulate that if the host state adopts a measure subsequent to the conclusion of the contract that is likely to have damaging consequences to the economic benefits of the original bargain for one or both parties, a rebalancing must take place. So this one also takes into the consideration the need to renegotiate the contract and ensure that the, the international oil company is not making losses due to the changes in the legal regime or even in the fiscal regime of a, count, of a country. Then we, we have... Uh, hybrid clauses, and then this combined the uh, unambiguous nat nature of prison clauses with provisions commonly found in economic equilibrium clauses. So with the hybrid clauses, you'll find a, a petroleum contract that would have freezing clauses. It will be freezing certain aspects of the contract. It will have the economic equilibrium clause. It will also have the rebalancing of benefits clause. So the hybrid clauses, you can find them in one petroleum contract, but in one petroleum contract, you find different types of stabilization clauses. Then you have the allocation of burden clauses. This seek to allocate the fiscal and related burdens created by unilateral change in the law. It is common for the resultant burden to be borne by the national oil company or the state. So here, they are allocating the fiscal or related burdens created by unilateral change in law. So if there is a change in the law, the legal regime, or there is a change in the fiscal regime, then what happens here is to allocate the burden or the losses to the national oil company or to the state. And still here, the, the international oil company is being protected because they're not going to bear the burden of the losses that have been caused because of the changes in laws. Then you have the prohibition on unilateral changes. This is also referred to as an intangibility clause. It prohibits unilateral changes to the investment agreement and requires the consent of both parties before any changes may be made. So here, unlike the freezing clauses, which freeze the law, this type of clause only freezes the contract. It tries to limit the state's capacity by requiring mutual consent to contract changes. So with this prohibition, it only prohibits the changes in the contract and where the government or the host state wants to make those changes, then they have to meet with the international oil companies and agree. So it's different from the freezing clause because the freezing clause actually is even telling you, you cannot introduce a law that is going to impact, negatively impact our investments. 
but here you can introduce the law, but you cannot change, you cannot make unilateral changes on the contract. Then you have the goodwill clause, and this is similar to the intangibility clause, although the scope of its application might differ. Basically, it suggests, as the name suggests, the goodwill clause is to the effect that the parties shall perform the contract with goodwill or good faith. Hence, the clause precludes unilateral modification or termination of the contract. So here, the parties, both the host state and the investor, they have to perform the contract in goodwill. So you cannot make changes that are going to negatively impact the whole the international company without having a discussion with them. You should have that goodwill in whatever actions you are, you are making. Then you have the combined stabilization clauses, and it's common for a regime or a petroleum sharing agreement to contain a combination of all the different types of stabilization clauses. So you can find an agreement where you all the different types of stabilization clauses that we have talked about are in just one that one agreement. So that's what you would call like the combined stabilization clause. But to move forward, these are not the only clauses in petroleum agreements. There are various other clauses that you have to look through that would require you to get a concession agreement and look at the key clauses in that contract. Get a petroleum sharing agreement, look at the key clauses in that contract. So uh, in your free time, look out for the different types of agreements, petroleum agreements, look at the clauses and even ask yourself, what are the impact of these clauses? And are the clauses still relevant in the 21st century? Are there some clauses that need to be changed? All those have to be looked into. And thank you. In the next session, we shall be able to cover all that.